and this is the um, the first PowerPoint um, introduction to viruses. And let's see, our last time, folks, we ended with a video that we called Vi "Virus General Properties um, Structures Part One," and um, that ended on slide 18. So this next video will be slides 18 through 24, and we're just going to call this "General Properties of Viruses Structures." Um, part two. Okay, so last time we, we went over classifications of viruses based on whether they use DNA or RNA as their genetic information. And then we introduced the concept, um, another way of classifying viruses as um, whether they are so called naked and they lack an envelope, or in contrast, if they're enveloped. And we said in general, naked viruses can survive longer in the environment. Um, in, in contrast to envelope viruses, the envelope is stolen host cell membrane. And remember, you guys, in the fluid mosaic model, um, cell membranes have the consistency of olive oil. So anything that damages the envelope once the viruses are shed into the environment, um, if the envelope is damaged, then the adhesins that are located in the envelope can no longer function. So usually envelope viruses don't remain infectious in the environment for all that long. So that was where we left off last time. So now we'll we'll proceed to slide um, 19, and um, the following slides, you guys, are just specific examples of naked and um, naked and envelope viruses, DNA and RNA viruses, just to give you some specific examples. So again, folks, this is just to give an example of a naked um, virus or virion. So um, here in our naked viruses, the nucleic acid inside the capsid could be DNA or RNA. And this, um, this outermost layer is made out of protein. And we can think of it as a protein coat, or the official name, it's a capsid. So it's made up of protein subunits called capsomeres. And there can be different proteins in the capsomeres. And we can see that capsomeres can form um, capsids of different shape. This would be an icosahedral. Um, capsid, which is a pretty common shape amongst the viral capsids. So an important part of the capsid is, number one, it's going to protect the DNA or the RNA from destruction. And then a second function, folks, is that on, on the capsid, on the outer surface, there'd be those special viral proteins called adhesins. And the function of the adhesins is to bind to complement, complementary host cell surface receptors. And the fancy term you guys for virus is attaching to a cell, it's called adsorption. I'm not sure why they had to come up with a new word, but when a virus attaches to, to its cell, it's called adsorption. And again, it's going to be adsorption is made possible through the viral adhesins binding to specific host cell surface receptors. And, and you'll see, folks, as we go along, we do know some of the host cell surface receptors for some of the viruses we'll be describing. Now, because the adhesins are located on this relatively, relatively tough resistant uh, protein capsid, when the viruses are shed into the environment, um, these capsids aren't easily destroyed, right? And so the adhesins won't be destroyed, the adhesins remain functional. So as a consequence, this means naked viruses in general remain infectious in the environment for longer periods of time as compared to our envelope viruses. So an, a couple of examples, folks, um, polio virus shed in the feces, it's naked. Um, and that means it can remain infectious in feces. So if the feces contaminates food or drinking water, and then we ingest that contaminated food or drinking water, that's one way we can infect it with polio, the virus. And another example of a naked virus are the papillomaviruses, the wart viruses. And the ones we'll be discussing are the HPVs, the human papillomaviruses. They too are naked, and thus they can remain infectious in the environment for long periods of time. And here's just some specific examples. Folks, these are, um, these are the, the lesions or abnormalities caused by the human papillomaviruses, so the classic warts, and fingers, bottom of the foot. Here's one here, and then it can also cause genital warts. Right? And then here is an example of um, a ward, probably in the 1950s, before we had the polio vaccines. And the um, polio is also a naked RNA virus. And we said transmission is fecal orally. And what happens, and some folks who get infected, 
the virus will replicate in our intestinal epithelial cells. That, that will happen with all of us, and thus it's shed in the feces. But then in a subpopulation of, of um, polio victims, the polio can invade the nervous system and cause paralysis. So um, not only would you be paralyzed, and for example, you couldn't walk, but the, um, the muscles involved in respiration will no longer function, so you can die from suffocation. So before we had the polio vaccine, we'd have wards of all these polio victims that were living in these what were called iron lungs. And what the iron lungs um, would do is they would cycle through positive and negative pressure. And that would permit the poor polio victims to, to breathe, right? But can you imagine what it must have been like, right? This was your life in your iron lung. And later you guys will talk about um, the two polio vaccines, which um, have in really reduced the occurrence of polio worldwide. It was hoped we could eradicate polio through a vaccination, but we'll talk about some problems that, that we've run into. This, folks, is a the rhinovirus. This is one of the so-called cold viruses. It's a naked virus, so um, it causes relatively mild upper respiratory tract infections. And again, if, if I have a rhinovirus infection, say in my upper respiratory tract, and I'm coughing or sneezing, you know, and that mucus is expelled, and the rhinovirus, because it is a naked virus, then if it lands on some surface, like a door handle, um, in, in those mucus droplets, it could remain infectious for quite a while. And then if you touched that contaminated surface, and then you, you touched your fingers to your eyes, your nose, your mouth, then that's how you could get infected with the rhinovirus. So we've just talked about naked viruses. Now we'll talk about envelope viruses. So in an envelope virus, folks, if we took, let's say from that last slide, we took our naked virus, right? Here's the, the capsid and inside the genetic information. If we take our naked virus and then wrap it in a layer of stolen host cell membrane, then we have an envelope virus. So this stolen host cell membrane on the outside is called the viral envelope. So remember, folks, fluid mosaic model phospholipid bilayer with proteins inserted. It has a consistency of olive oil, and so it's easily damaged, right? Now the reason envelope damage would make the um, envelope viruses um, non-infectious is where do you think the viral adhesins are located, right? So it makes sense the viral adhesins have to be on the outermost surface, the outermost layer of the virus, so the virus has to insert its viral adhesins into the host cell membrane. The host cell membrane, it's going to steal um, because the um, viral adhesins have to be in that stolen host cell membrane. The vir viral adhesins have to be in the envelope. So if envelope viruses are shed into the environment, um, again, drying, UV, good old soap, alcohols, um, bleach, anything that damages the envelope means the adhesins can no longer function. And thus, envelope viruses generally will not remain infectious in the environment for long periods of times, long periods of time um, compared to naked viruses. Now this is of huge interest, you guys, for us because the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus that's causing our pandemic right now, it's an envelope virus. And you've probably heard lots of reports about studies to discover how long the novel coronavirus can remain infectious on surfaces. And I've heard conflicting data. Um, in some studies, the um, coronavirus is no longer present. And we'll talk about what we mean by present, um, maybe only after four or five hours. Um, and then depending on the surface upon which the coronavirus is deposited, other reports say it can remain present for up to three days. Um, and again, folks, I, I'm probably going to make too big a deal of it. The important thing we need to find out is how they're detecting the presence of the coronavirus. Often what they use is a process called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, where they're, they're maybe swabbing a surface and then using enzymes to make multiple copies of the viral RNA in this cool process called polymerase chain reaction. And then you look for the presence of the viral RNA. Okay. Well, you could have a coronavirus on a surface whose whose envelope is damaged, right, so it's no longer infectious, but you would still be able to detect that viral, um, the coronavirus viral RNA by PCR, but that doesn't mean the virus is infectious. So again, we'll come back to that. You guys, maybe we'll have another PowerPoint on, on some of those um, 
some of those details, which I think is really important for us to understand the natural history of the novel coronavirus. Okay, so um, as we said, the virus is going to insert its viral proteins, its adhesins, into the envelope before it escapes. Now in this virus, they have a number of different um, viral proteins present, um, but we can presume that at least one of these knobs or spikes is going to be the viral adhesins. And again, the function of the viral adhesins, they're going to bind to specific host cell surface receptors in the process of attachment or absorption. And folks, really important, if the virus cannot attach to our cells, it can't infect our cells. And we'll see this is the goal of um, uh, vaccination. We're going to try to vaccinate um, our children, our patients, um, get our patients to develop antibodies that will block to the adhesins and then block the ability of the virus to attach to our cells. So such antibodies are called neutralizing antibodies, and that's the goal of um, vaccinations. It's also what our body just does naturally. If we get infected with a virus, our body will make antibodies against the viral adhesins, right? And that's what that's one way we our body will help, our immune system will help us um, clear the virus. And then hopefully if we have, um, if we continue to have effective um, antibody production, it might protect us from infection in the future. And again, you guys are going to see with the coronaviruses, since they are RNA viruses, they're always, you know, always mutating. So um, it, it's a little bit more challenging coming up with vaccines that can provide li lifelong infection against um, multiple mutant um, uh, variants of some of these RNA viruses. But again, we'll, we'll talk about that probably in a, in a follow-up video. Just some examples, folks, of Envelope viruses, so the herpes virus family, which is a huge family of viruses, um, um, we'll be talking about herpes viruses that can cause infections of the mouth, um, infections of our fingers, infections of the genital tract, but again, they're envelope viruses, so usually um, once they're shed into the environment, and once the viruses dry up and that envelope damaged, they're usually no longer um, infectious, right? And then here, and, about the only good news you guys I know about HIV is thank heaven it is an envelope virus so it should not remain infectious on surfaces for very long unless it's protected by um, moist organic material right so blood tissues um, and if we're talking about enteric viruses like feces um, is as long as the virus is protected by moist organic material it can remain um, infectious even if it's an envelope virus And then, folks, we're almost ready to um, close this little video, um, so I don't want you to panic, but in looking, um, in looking um, at classification of viruses, remember we said they can be naked or enveloped, DNA or RNA viruses. Just quickly, I'd like to look at this table that shows the families of DNA viruses, human DNA viruses. So let's just count the families. So one, two, three, four five, six, seven, okay. And I just added folks, and, and if, if it's a naked virus, so naked, naked, naked virus, if there's no N, it means they're envelope viruses, right? So again, folks, let's just remember that there were seven DNA virus families, and we wanna compare that. Look at the number of um, human RNA virus families. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So more than twice as many RNA uh, virus families. And, and folks, why do you think that is? Knowing what you know about um, the enzymes that copy RNA compared to the enzymes that copy DNA, why do you think there's such a greater variety of RNA virus families? So probably it's because um, the enzymes that make RNA, the RNA polymerases, they don't proofread, right? They don't edit and consequently they can't correct their mistakes, so they're going to have really high mutation rates. And one example would be one mutation in every 10 to the 4th or 10 to the 5th nucle nucleotides. And as a result, then we're going to get this incredible diversity amongst the RNA viruses compared to our DNA viruses. Okay, folks, so I think what we're going to do there, right, what we'll do is we're going to stop this video, and the next video will be on bacteria, phage, bacteria, virus, structure, and replication. And this will be cool, you guys, because not only um, was it our 
understanding of bacterial virus, bacteriophage replication, that helped us later to understand replication of human and animal viruses. We're also going to see folks that now in the era, era of antibiotic resistance, there's renewed interest in the possibility of using bacteriophage to kill antibiotic resistant bacteria that are infecting our patients. Um, and if, if I can find it, there's an awesome TED talk on this topic. And I think, I think the title of the TED talk was something like How Sewage Saved My Husband's Life. So it's pretty powerful. So we'll close this one down, folks, and then we'll do um, bacteriophage um, structure and replication in the next video. And this, we're stopping on slide 25, folks, and that's where we'll, we'll start on the next um, movie, audio, rather.